our conversation for the last couple of weeks has been about what are often known as the clouds of glory. So, um, in, and in chapter nine, in verse 15, Uh, it it mentioned that on the day that the Mishkan was assembled, put up, the cloud uh, covered the Mishkan, uh, the tent of the testimony. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you tell me where we are, Rabbi? Chapter 9 in Bamidbar, verse 15. So it said it covered um, during the day, it covered um, as a cloud, and at night it appeared like a fire until the morning. Rabbi Foreman um, has. Made, made this point um, on a few occasions that if uh, you had somebody who had never really looked at the Torah before, had never studied the Torah, had been exposed to the Torah, and you asked them, they would, they would assume that the Torah is a book of theology. It, it would be a book that would it, it sort of explain the topography of the spiritual world. So there'd be a lot of discussion about the nature of God, a lot of discussion about the nature of the soul, a lot of discussion about the nature of the spiritual world. But when you actually study the Torah, you find not so much that there's very little discussion about the nature of God. There's very little discussion about the nature of the soul. There's very little discussion of the nature of the spiritual world. That's at first blush. Um, the, uh, there's a famous, uh, so he, he suggests that if you were really going to characterize the Torah, it would be more correct to characterize it as the a guide to the relationship between God and the Jewish people or between God, you know, God and mankind or, or God and the Jewish people. It's about the nature of the relationship and what it is that God wants from us in this, in this relationship. Um, there's a, Ramosha Shapiro, blessed memory, had um, once mentioned that what he considers one of the best questions about the Torah is why doesn't the Torah talk about the world to come, about what happens after we, after we die? This is a question that several have um, taken a stab at over um, you know, hundreds of years, last hundreds of years. Um, one of them, what, what is his uh, sort of favorite answer to this question was the question of the Shla. The Shla is a, a work called Shnei Luchot Habrit. It was the work of a Kabbalist from a few hundred years ago. I, I believe his name was Levi Yitzhak Horowitz, um, who's considered one of his, his work is considered a monumental work and much studied, especially um, as a kind of doorway to mysticism. And the Shlo's answer was, every, when I look into the Torah, all I see is the world to come. And um, I think in that case, the world to come is a kind of shorthand for um, the world of the spirit. <clears throat> the, the, 
you know, where it is that uh, maybe the spirit heads to, maybe, uh, but you could sort of get a taste of what he means uh, when you start to uh, take notice of what at first just appears to be a detail, but when you start to explore this detail and look at different texts mm -hmm. that reference it, you start to see that there's really a lot more than you first thought about the spiritual world. And especially um, if not uh, an in-depth discussion about the nature of God, at least God as he is available to us in our relationship with him. Um, and uh, so that's what we did the last couple of weeks. We were looking at all these different uh, references, especially um, when God's communicating with us or, or God, when, when the Torah is describing God's presence or God with us. And most often, it's, there's a discussion of clouds and of fire. Now the Torah, if when we pay careful attention to how the Torah describes it, even here, um, the Torah is not saying that God is the cloud and the Torah is not saying that God is the fire, but that the um, when we hear God, it's often, from the midst of the cloud or from the midst of fire. And also when we experience his presence, um, it's, it's often um, associated with cloud and, and fire. Um, there, there was one uh, point, I think it was in the Torah portion of uh, Et Hanan, which is, uh, the second Torah portion in the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, where I think it mentions fire like so many times and associated with God, just in a few verses. It's talking about fire. We were talking about that on one of the Tuesday nights. It's just fire, fire, fire. And the people characterize about being close to him, being uh, in a fire. But, but, and Moshe at the burning bush, there's like a fire, and God is. So the. Even again, if we look carefully, it's not saying he is the cloud or, or he is the fire, <clears throat> but rather they are somehow representative of the fact that that he is there. Um, and this is part of our um, challenge when it comes to God, because even the Torah itself tells us there is no tamuna, there is no image of God. Uh, so, and we were talking about this the last couple of weeks that uh, it's Maimonides' third principle of, out of his 13 principles of faith that God is not embodied in the physical in that sense. He's not incarnate in a person or incarnate in something, but certainly he is to some degree experienced in the physical. So we, our senses uh, our, our main vehicle for um, receiving information outside of our person. And, uh, and so um, there are times when our senses, um, they, don't, they don't perceive God per se, but they perceive something um, that's kind of context for God or um, that, that, for us is meant to indicate um, that, that in, in some sense, God is, is present or, or God is, is close. We, this um, aspect of our relationship with God, which is certainly very intimate and um, like many intimate things, it doesn't have words that are able to really capture the entirety of it. So like we, we use words like, let's say love or hate or, um, you know, we, we use these words um, 
but we recognize they're just words and that they they don't they're not capable of really uh, capturing the nuance they 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 are something so i i could say to somebody i love them and like every human being says that to somebody else they say the exact same words right? it's not exactly the same no two relationships are exactly the same and and, and there's there can be all sorts of nuance in love. There, there's different kinds of love. There's the love of a parent to a child. There's a love of friends. There's a love of a husband and wife. They are, we, we use the same word. We recognize that there's nuance missing, but we can't help it because these are um, uh, in some sense deeper than words or bigger than, than words. Um, and uh, that's um, a problem that we have with words, but it's also true with our senses in general, that our, our senses, uh, there are some people that have more refined senses and they're capable of more, but still there is some limit to what our senses can, um, can grasp. And uh, so, e e so, uh, we make do with um, sort of broad generalities, um, but sort of rely on experience to make up for what the words can't do or what our senses can't um, can't identify um, exactly. So, you, you rely on the fact that you're having an internal experience and at the same time you're using these um, and, and it's that combination. So for instance, let's say you were talking to somebody who never uh, experienced love. So they could hear about love from you, but they wouldn't know and, and, and they could hear about it from poets and they could read stories about love. Um, and they could sort of, they could get like a, a, an, idea. an idea, you know, but it's an, a very external idea. It's not a real understanding. Mm -hmm. But if, if a person experiences it and then people talk about it, then, then even then, even then, um, when we try to use our intellect, and try to codify it or uh, try to define it, we come up short, but at least in, with that combination, we are in the conversation. We're, we're in some kind of conversation. And it seems like this is the expectation when it comes to a relationship with God, um, that uh, the relationship with God is, there are words and expressions and um, they do, a certain something, something, and then in partnership with our experience, they're 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 meant to help. Even then, again, even then, if you if what you're trying to do is um, come to some kind of specific intellectual result, you're going to come up short because the again the intellect. Uh, the faculty of intellect and especially language, they're not capable of completely uh, doing this. This is why we have poetry. Why do we have poets? Poets spend their time um, uh, in, with those ideas, um, in other words, with those phenomena, which uh, uh, words come up short with, and they they, through their own kind of artistry, try to get um, to some place where at least they're pointing to, you know, in, in maybe a better way, they're pointing to the thing and maybe pointing to aspects of the thing. Again, they recognize, poets recognize that they can't do what can't be done. They can't uh, define something. And they they can't um, they can't use intellectual proof for something. 
uh, it, uh, for these kind of things because uh, again, they're not they, these are either deeper than it or bigger than it uh, and and but they can approach it and they can especially point to it uh, which again can be useful so once you have had an experience um, and and then you see some language um, then you realize that this language is pointing to that. So, um, you know, when the Shloss says that all I see is the world to come in the Torah, uh, the explanation would be because he lives in the realm of the spirit and, and in the connection to the spirit. So then when he sees the poetry, which is pointing to it, this poetry is actually useful. It's, it, it's actually very helpful. But, but if we're not used to it, if we're not living in the realm of the spirit, or if we're not, if we're not, um, if, if we're not encouraged to trust the experiences that we've had and recognize that those are important and they're really meant to be um, like a partner with the text, um, then, then we don't, uh, then we don't see it in the text. We we don't see the text. We saw the words, but we don't see it. But once, <clears throat> once we've been encouraged to rely on, and sort of mentored in recognizing um, that point, those points of connection between us and and Hashem, and then we're shown. The, a couple of the places, then we start to see it all over. Like I think the experience was for us in the last few weeks when we're looking at all those references to the clouds and all those references to the fire and start, <clears throat> they start to uh, emerge and, and, uh, and become prominent in, in, in when otherwise get sort of passed over and not seen as, uh, as significant. But there's always... I know for me and a lot of people I know have had experiences where they said, I feel that God was watching over me. Right. Let's say you say something like that. And he's not, there. he's obviously not there. Right. And, and by the way, this is, this is also the case in our relationships with each other. I don't see you. I, I see your body. I don't see <laughs> the part, the, that aspect you of don't you, see my inner spirit. which is what I connect to, right. the the you that I care about, is that spirit. If uh, you know, if if somebody was in a morgue and they saw somebody made up, let's say uh, you're, we don't do it, but let's say you're at some place where they have a wake and and you see the person all laid out, uh, looking fresh and you know, like they're <laughs> they're just there. Like they're taking a nap. Right, but they're every you recognize that's not them they're still not here that aspect of them that um i i cared about and that i've been relating to the whole time is no longer here so but how do i know how to relate to that now again i have i have it is helpful that there is a body it that is helpful but it it's it's still not it it sort of gives me direction it helps me know where to look you know when i'm talking to yeah. you but it doesn't but it's not uh, the essence that I'm really relating to. And, and so there is a kind of internal, uh, maybe instinctual um, a sense and ability to interact with the unseen that, that I experience um, with, in relationship with people all the time. And with God, that's all there is. But there can be with guidance this is that kind of thing there can be with guidance um kind of mentoring to um to sort of help uh especially when uh, our sense is deeply instinctual and and it's not in the in the realm of intellect or the senses but i need it to i you know this is where i function in the world i i need my intellect to be involved and connected and I need my senses to be involved and connected. So there is a kind of mentoring that 
that can help us. And um, this is how uh, many understand the mitzvahs that especially uh, I'm gonna suggest the mitzvahs of this time and, and the mitzvah of sukkah in particular only because it, it is dealing with these clouds. That's why I'm, I'm coming back to sukkah besides the fact that it's uh, sukkahs uh, coming up because we're told that the sukkah, we're, we're, the sukkah is the clouds of glory. That's, that's what we're told from the Talmud, that, that um, w- which, what does that mean? Obviously, they're not literally the clouds of glory. They don't look like clouds, and, uh, uh, and they certainly aren't the exact, they, you know, physically, they're not the clouds of glory. But there's something here. This would be the mentoring. This would be like um, if you had a wise mentor, imagine you were Kwai Cheng Kane and Kung Fu, and you had one of your mentors from the Shaolin Monastery who's waiting for you to have some experience. And then he tells you what it means, you know, like that wise, blind um, sage that he often uh, learned from or one of his other sages. So this is, you know, the the Torah is, is like this. And um, but even we need help just to, to even see how the Torah is like this. Again, once you've seen it um, and you've seen the connections and you've had the intuitive part and you've started to see the connections, you on your own can start to see some of these things without a lot more mentoring, without needing it. But but even then, there's, there's a lot of sophistication that is available. Uh, in that mentoring, because there's still times when you can confuse it and mix it up. It, it, it just is the very, and without having something that's absolutely defined clearly in a way that our senses and intellect can you know, immediately see it, there's, gonna, there's always going to be some vagary that requires help in, in order to, in order to, um, to, to, to get to the depth of it. But so, like, let's say, for instance, there's an, uh, this is a Hasidic notion that's very much emphasized in Chabad, that during the month of Elul, uh, <clears throat> they call it the king is in the field. That, and this is the, the way of suggesting that there's a special kind of opportunity uh, for closeness with God that is available in this month uh, as we're approaching uh, Rosh Hashanah. And, it's an, and, and because it's special and because uh, it's uh, transient, it's, it's something that uh, is not uh, reliably there, you should take full advantage of it, this kind of thing. Um, so that is a kind of guidance that's coming from mystics um, who... Um, you know, have found language that they hope can can help us take full advantage of some kind of spiritual opportunity that's here. You have people that are um, that have particularly sensitive palates. Um, there are people that naturally have sensitive palates. There are people that train themselves to uh, they train their palates to be. Uh, more sensitive, but let's say you have somebody who um, is a sommelier. So uh, there's a documentary a about. Yeah, <laughs> there's a documentary about. Did you ever see that? It's I think it's called Som S O M M or something. There's a documentary. I think it's on Netflix. There's there's actually I think two of them um, where it talks about the rigorous training of these people who become sommelier. The the actual profession. Mm-hmm usually um, plays, usually this is a person in a fine restaurant who's uh, going to be the one who suggests which wine you should have with which meal and, and, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but they're training, they have this rigorous training. And part of it is to refine their sense of taste so that they can notice all the subtleties in the in the flavor. So you have a particular grape and there's so there's elements of flavor that um, are produced by this grape. 
they'll say of this wine. And they'll say things that has notes of this and that, and elements of this, etc. My attitude is after the first sip, who cares? Right, <laughs> I know. And most of us, uh, most of us, you know, uh, move on in life without knowing. But it's just uh, it's an example of how you could have somebody with a kind of a refined sense. And it's the thing about it is that there is a practical benefit to this, um, and this is a way that and, and they can the ones who know can tell if somebody else has it yeah they can test them and they can tell if they have it and there, there's actual schools for this and tests in order it's very rigorous and it's incredible what these people have to be able to do in order to get to the level of sommelier that would allow them to be in the finest restaurants but one of the tests is does it in fact pair well with this with this, uh, with this food, um, and was it a good choice? And also, if they themselves, you know, they themselves can sort of help you find what's special in this. There's also that movie Sideways, which is a movie I really like with Paul Giamatti, and uh, it's also a kind of uh, it's a movie that is it takes it takes place. Uh, some guys are on a trip through wine country going through their own life dramas, but they're in wine country and they happen to be really connoisseurs of wine. Um, but this is sort of a model for um, uh, things of the spirit. In other words, there, there are people who um, have a developed sense and a kind of a very um, sensitive palate when it comes to matters of the spirit and, and uh, especially when it comes to a relationship with the divine, with a relationship with God. And so we tend to rely on them because we don't have as much of a net, you know, we haven't refined it. We, we haven't had the mentoring or we don't have maybe even the natural, even with the mentoring, maybe we wouldn't get so far. So we tend to rely on them. So let's say one of them says, now's the time you know like this month is the time you know for for pouring your heart out to god and if you're if you're looking to um uh, take your level with uh with uh, of the of your relationship with god to another level a new level of depth etc this this is a, a particularly auspicious time to do it so People will rely on it. And so you'll see, like within the Hasidic world, you'll see what you what would be like 99% of the people are just relying on, on this teaching, like you would rely on the sommelier who says, I think this wine would pair perfectly with this meal that you're having. Um, so, and again, you're to some degree, that's enough, you know, for a lot of us, that's enough. Um, we'll also rely on them for Rosh Hashanah. There's very little text about Rosh Hashanah. There's very little to give us guidance in the Torah. There's almost nothing. It's a, it's a holiday. It's a holiday. Um, there's a special sacrifices that are brought on this holiday in the Beit Hamikdash, and then there's something to do with a shofar blowing. There's either a memory of a trua or a day of the trua. There's something about shofar blowing and the trua sound. That's basically the guidance we get from the, the Torah itself. And then you have chapter eight in the book of Nehemiah, where there's an actual uh, kind of record of, of a Rosh Hashanah that happened uh, at the beginning of the second commonwealth with Ezra and Nehemiah. And this is you know, sort of Nehemiah's record of what happened at that time. So you get a little more nuance, a little more detail about the day. It's supposed to be a day of joy but mixed with some kind of trepidation. The people were crying at first because of something that Ezra was reading. And then they were cautioned, this is not a day of sadness. This is supposed to be a day of joy. Go home, have a festive meal, eat sweet things, drink sweet things, give gifts to your friends. This is supposed to be a time of joy. So you have this sense that there's a kind of mixture of trepidation and joy that's that's meant to be part of the texture of the holiday. But for much, for much of it, we're relying on the guidance of the sommeliers of the spirit. 
They are, they are saying, lean in heavy on the notion of judgment. Lean in heavy on the notion of taking a kind of inventory. Lean in heavy on, um, on uh, the newness, that there, there's some kind of newness of the year. Again, a lot of these are things we don't see. We don't see. There's there's somebody who uh, in one of my classes they they just said to me I have a friend this is one of the guys Albert he said I have a friend who just says it's all made up Rosh Hashanah is all made up everything we do is made up so we talked about the show for Paris that mentioned the fact that it's a holiday is mentioned the fact that it's right near Yom Kippur and Sukkot is also a clue I mean there's clues there's some clues that even we who are uh, not so uh, necessarily in tune might see, we, we might see some of those, but yes, a lot of the elements are not. And this is our, this is sort of our own, you could say it's our own predicament um, because um, we've chosen not to devote our life to learning how to capture those subtleties. Okay, there are some people that might want to be sommeliers that no matter how hard they try, they're never gonna get very far. And that might be true with the spirit too. There might be some people that they're just not, not born with whatever faculties are necessary to get to a state of real refinement. But it's a choice a lot of us made and we have to take responsibility for that choice. It's like, a, it's like I, I, you know, I can say, um, you know, I'm frustrated with doctors because they are telling me to do something and I want to know why. But, the, you know, the doctor's looking at me going, if you wanted to know why, you'd need to go to years of school. I went to years of school. I can try to explain it to you, but there's a limit to what I can explain to you. You're just going to have to trust me. You, you, you came to me because I chose to devote years of my life to this. And you don't, you didn't, and I get it. You know, not everybody has to, but then when I'm telling you, you need to do it, you have to trust me. Now, that doesn't mean we always do. And obviously we're all responsible for the choices that we make, but, but uh, when the, it's, there is, you know, there's a, a big element of truth there. If I'm, if this is something that requires a lot of time and devotion and expertise, and I've chosen to, you know, focus on other things, then I have no choice but to rely on the people that spent a lot of time doing it. Now, I still am able to exercise the, my you choice. You still argue with them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, fine. And I have an intellect and there's some things that don't require a ton of experience. They just are, are you know, uh, common sense. And those things I should be able to, you know, chime in on. And, uh, and also, it's not entirely true that I haven't spent any time on it i am studying it so i i i could you know get involved to a certain degree but i do have to have the humility of recognizing that there there's just going to be some things that i'm not and i somebody could think it's a bunch of hogwash you know like some sommelier is coming in and he's telling me all this stuff there's notes of this and notes of that and i could just go oh, that's a bunch of hogwash but again they're they're they do have and you could see this in that documentary there are people who are, you know, with very sophisticated palates who can tell if other people are onto it or not. And these people are vetted, you know, in a lot of these things. They are vetted and there is a way to vet them. There, there, there is a system to vet them. So there's, it's, not, it's not like there's nothing there. Um, you know, again, there are, there are those who suggest that nowadays when it comes to these matters of the spirit, we don't have people that like they used to with a kind of depth of um, sophisticated, you know, kind of sophistication of, of a palate um, that, um, that, that people used to nowadays. We don't have as much and maybe they, even our uh, more spiritual people are relying on the guidance from other people and, and the testimony from other people. And, and, I, and it's possible you could even tell, I feel like every once in a while I can tell when somebody's telling me what they read, or if they're telling something that they know, you know, like, a, like and especially when somebody's talking about, um, uh, you know, deep matters of the of the spirit, um, 
a lot, you just are, I'm, I'm assuming when I'm listening to them that, that a lot of what I'm hearing is stuff they read and not necessarily stuff they know because they read a lot, but they don't, they don't necessarily know a lot, but, but that's not, uh, you know, that's not true in every case. Uh, there's still people out there with a lot of sophistication, but certainly there were people before. And also every once in a while you do bump into, or you have an, an experience with somebody who just um, exudes um, wow. this, yeah. Yeah, and I guess by knowledge I mean the experience plus plus the mentoring. You know, like uh, you have it, and with some people they wonder about the mentoring. Like, where did they get the mentoring? And and that some people have had it at so young. Like somebody like uh, the Don of Vilna. They they were, they're saying like by the time he was thirteen, he's already delving and making golems and stuff like that. I mean, he's like you have some people, and then you wonder how could they how could they really know it because they haven't had the mentoring like uh, so so how can they really know it uh, and then there's people best that may you know there i don't know there's there's explanations for because there's some people who've, who've who've seen it and go on and, and try to test these people afterwards the you know, the experts and uh and then they see they do know. So then they have to come up with some other explanation. They're an old soul, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and, and somehow, you know, they've had the mentoring in another way, a previous life or, or something like that. Yeah, but, it's, like, it's like a little kid who's five or six who picks up golf clubs for the first time and can actually play. Right. But then there's somebody who, like, let, you, you could hear, born. like you'll hear, like somebody, they'll call it natural talent like incredible natural talent. Let's say you have a chess prodigy and, and like with chess, they'll, they'll see strategies mm -hmm. and then they'll go, how could this kid know strategies? Like maybe, maybe this kid can pick up things and he can see patterns, but how does he have a, how does he have the strategies? How, do, how does he seem, you know, there's, there's certain things that seem to be just beyond explanation. Right. It, it, you know, and I don't know what to say about it. But you know, the, there are people that grab, grab, grapple for it because, or, gra or are grasping for it, because they, because the for most people that is the combination that you need um, this, this this sort of intuition and what we call natural talent, and then then you need um, guidance, you need uh, the mentoring, and almost everybody needs the mentoring. Almost everybody benefits from the mentoring. They uh, especially. Um, now, right now, the conversation is about professional quarterbacks in the book, you know, professional football quarterbacks, and a lot of discussion about Jordan Love and uh, Fields and and certain other new newish quarterbacks that are coming up. And I, you're hearing a lot of people talk about the the how important guidance from experienced people are for these guys, and and uh, in order. And you can see the difference when somebody has this kind of guidance and somebody doesn't have it, and there's exceptions. But for the most part, that's the case. So again, what does this have to do with us? So I'm suggesting that this is, when it comes to our approach to Torah and studying Torah, it, we need to remember this, that especially when it comes to the matters of the spirit and our relationship with God, there's an assumption of a kind of dual um, track that there's going to be our own personal instinctual knowledge that comes from our own connection with God and some deep understanding of a connection to God that just comes from the fact that we are human beings and built with it. But then there's also this kind of mentoring. When we ourselves become mentored, we start to see the difference. You, you, start, you, you, you start to see it. When we like, and I and I've told Rabbi Foreman this on multiple occasions, and I've told other people about Rabbi Foreman when when it, when it's this, that one of the real remarkable things about the way he's been teaching is that he he shares his process in a way that is available to regular people like us that we can see him do it a few times, and then we can do it ourselves he's not the only one there's other teachers that that um at, that are able to do this and do it but he is really uh, 
uh, are remarkably gifted at, at doing it and at articulating it and sharing it, but there's other teachers that do it as well. That part of what they're doing when they're, when they're, when they're um, learning with us is that they're showing us the connections. Yeah. The different little connections. Right. And then on our own, you know, we find ourselves going, oh, that's interesting. What about this? And what about that? And what about this? Now, if we're lucky enough, we have the person available and we can say to them, what do you think about this? And then they'll go, yeah, I agree. And they're encouraging it. And maybe they'll go, uh, I don't think that's the same as this. And they'll show you why. And they're helping you to refine it. So the tools so that you can get better at it. But so um, so I'm, I'm just suggesting that especially with things about the nature of God and the nature of the soul and um, uh, a spiritual way in the world, the Torah can look like it doesn't talk about it at all. There are people who looked at the Torah and think Jews do not believe in the soul. There are people who look in the Torah and think that God could just be nature. There are people who look in the Torah, you know, there, there's all sorts of conclusions that somebody can have but uh, but but then if you again you you if you allow yourself to use this combination you can start to see that there's a lot more there than first BCI and this is especially important now because you have something like Rosh Hashanah which is a holiday where it's relying a ton on the guidance of mystics a ton of it is relying on the guidance of mystics. 90% of our experience of Rosh Hashanah is relying on the guidance of mystics because there's just not as much there. Even Yom Kippur, if you started to look at it, Yom Kippur, there's much more there. You'd get a, you, you recognize Yom Kippur from the text. But even that, our, our experience of Yom Kippur, the way we do it, and especially the liturgy, the liturgy is um, you know, very much infused with this kind of guidance. As to, as to what's going on. And, and again, and the big mistake with dealing with these things is to take anything too literally. And by that, I mean, we're, we have to recognize that we're dealing in a realm where words are not enough. Which, so that means that you can't latch onto the words. You have to, you have to like look at where the words are pointing. You have to, you have to hold on with a light grasp to any one of the words because they're they're pointing. Take the notion of a judgment on Rosh Hashanah. So if you looked at the liturgy and you look at the guidance that you see in halachic works and other places for Rosh Hashanah, so you come to the conclusion that there's a judgment going on and that you are, there's a list of things that you've done and this list is uh, in a certain sense amounts to a charge sheet you're being accused of this and accused of that and accused of this and uh, you're going to look at those things and you're going to make an argument that you uh, are going to get better at this and that and this and therefore they shouldn't be taken as a final um, record of who you are or any kind of final indication of who you are human beings evolve and we change and we're not just, uh, can't be summed up by any one thing that we did and we're gonna work on it and change it or, or things like that. So that that is, uh, you know, essentially wh what you uh, come away with for, for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, right? But you could ask a few questions and you the whole thing falls apart. The whole thing falls apart. First of all, who, where is this charge sheet? Where is the list? If, if I'm really being judged, what court would judge you but not tell you what you're being judged for? No court would do that. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, abuse to put somebody, it's a Kafka story. It's a Kafka-esque story. You're, you're, you're on trial. In fact, he has a story, the trial. And the guy doesn't know what he's being tried for. And that's considered a horror story, right? And, and, and so... Uh, you're so then they say to you, oh, don't worry, you do know, you know what you're being charged for. You were there. So, you know, but the truth is I'm the least likely person to uh, to know because <laughs> I am so 
un, I'm, I'm so biased. I'm so unable to be objective about myself. I have so many blind spots when I look at myself. And, and so, yeah, I can't be relied upon to come up with a list. Let's say, though, let's say somebody says, oh, you'll come up with a good chunk of them. How come I don't look at the list of the things I did right? There's no emphasis on that. Now, if I'm being judged. You're being judged on the things you did wrong. Why would I be judged only on the things I did wrong? There is no judgment like that. There's no uh, evening the scale. Right. As, I mean, you could say if it was one thing I'm being accused of, maybe, maybe you're just being accused of that one thing. But that's not how, it's not, no. if you're talking about a judgment, and especially the way it's characterized, your good deeds are measured against your bad deeds. We have no emphasis on finding the good things. None. There's nobody who says, there's nobody who says, write a, write a list before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And have your list, on Yom Kippur, have your list, not just your al chates. Al mitzvahs. Why don't you have a whole list of my mitzvahs? They, you, they, if I'm, if what's going to happen, you're going to end up with a thing. You're going to have what I did positive, what I did negative. If the negative outweighs the positive. The positive outweighs the negative. That's how the Rambam talks about it. So there's no emphasis on doing that. There's no emphasis on on looking at the at the at the positive things that they did. And also, there, you know, I'm not told what the judgment was. What kind of system would not tell me what the judgment is? That's complete. That that's a horror. That's a, that's 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 even worse than being on trial. And I don't know what the trial is. I find out there was a judgment, and I'm not told what the judgment was. That this cannot be. This cannot be. That th this is clearly there's. I'm, this is clearly an exercise. It's a mentoring. It's a guidance. Do this because this is going to help you fully realize the energy of the day. It's going to fully allow you for the kind of connection with God that is available during this time. Do this, but don't take it too seriously. And the way I know that you're not supposed to take it too seriously, and by too seriously, I mean, what I mean is do it fully for Rosh Hashanah. Do it fully for Yom Kippur. Take it seriously for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and then let go. And then let go. And that's what it even says. There's a, you know, it'll say, this is guidance in, in Halachas Farim. I even had a matzah that said this. After Yom Kippur is over, the shofar blows. And now I move on with trust that God found me, uh, you know, uh, that I succeeded in the judgment. And I look forward to sukkahs with joy and love. The mitzvahs of sukkahs with joy and love. Now, how? How could I do that if I was really, I, the only way you can do that is you have to be able to let go. How can you let go? The way you let go is because you realize this, there's guidance that this is the best way to make use of this time. But that's all it is. It's guidance on how to make best use of it. Now, move on. Move on to the next thing because there's a way to make best use of sukkahs. And that way is with joy and love. So now you're going to switch off that because that was good for them. And now you're going to switch on to this because this is good for this. And this is how you make the best use of this. And during Hanukkah, there's a way to make best use of that. And during Sukkot and Pesach and Purim, there's a way to make best use of that. For Pesach and Shavuos, there's best ways to make use of, of those things. And honestly, on Monday and Tuesday, there's a best way to make use of Monday and Tuesday. There's guidance for those things too. Take the guidance as best you can. Make the best use of it. But recognize, I am not, I did not become the sommelier. I did not become a sommelier. I'm taking their guidance because I trust them. And I'm trying to make best use of it. And I'm going to do my best job that I know how to do it. And then I'm going to move on. But most of the people that are talking about it don't have any idea how God works. We have little clues. When I say any idea, I mean 99.99999% we don't know. I mean, we have little clues, but for the most part, we don't know how he judges. We we have no, we don't know how he judges. And, and we admit in various places that we don't really know how he judges, but this is the best way. What is the best way? Try your best. Come up with the stuff, you know, and, and what is most useful? Come up with the stuff you did wrong. That is most useful. <laughs> that, that That is going to be most useful. Come up with the stuff you did wrong. But try to come up with a plan to, to be better. That, that is the best use uh, of this time. That's the best use of this. And then on sukkahs, uh, you know, focus on sukkahs. And one of the things to focus on sukkahs is this notion, this notion of the, 
clouds of glory, which we, you know, we're, we're getting a little flavor of is, is, is though th there's the, this sukkah, if, if, if I'm focusing on the sukkah as representing the clouds of glory, what part of what I'm uh, focusing on or the experience that I'm looking for is a sense of an embrace by the divine, a sense of closeness to him, to his presence. Um, that, and that's where I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to focus. Think about the cloud over the Mishkan. Think about the cloud on Mount Sinai. Think about the cloud that led the people through the desert. Think about the pillar of cloud as we're going out of Egypt that guided us and also protected us. Think of them as a guide, as protection, as a, you know, as, as the Shekhinah, as a kind of loving mother and divine embrace and, and those kinds of things. That's what it, I'm supposed to focus on then. And I will, I will get it. Just like when they pair the wine well, I get it. And I will get this too. If I allow myself to be open to it, and to, to experience it, because it's about the experience. It's not just about the data. It's also about the experience. And it's really more about the experience than the data. Because the data, I recognize, don't fully capture it. They, they don't. They're only pointing to it. Most of this is going to be the experience. Allow myself to have the, the experience, and I will get it, just like I do when I have a fine pairing of a wine. With the, with the meal. And then also I'm being a little mentored into it. And maybe I'm going to start seeing these things that they saw and I'm going to see, and I'm, and it's going to be uh, something that is in my tool chest when it comes to my relationship with God, that I don't always need somebody pointing to that. I'm starting to be able to sense on my own. So that is that. I look forward to many times of learning together, including next week.